Well, good morning. And in fact, I should say good, good, good morning, uh, because we have two guests here today. Uh, Paul Willey, who, as you can see, is dialing in from our offices here in London. Uh, but Dimitri Vinos is dialing in from Boston. So it's about, uh, about six in the morning over there. And we really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Now, uh, both Paul and Dimitri have been doing a tremendous amount of work on the efficiency of markets over many years. Uh, Paul is, you know, well known, I think, to, to many of us uh, as one of the leaders in, in thinking, particularly when he was setting up a, a GMO many years ago. But they've got some very, very interesting and I hope uh, slightly controversial remarks to make about giant funds and market mispricing. Now, you know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors of Zien. And the only reason that we can introduce so many of these wonderful and wide ranging webinars is because of the tolerance and generosity of our sponsors to allow us to range widely and freely across technology, economics, and finance. And today we may not be doing much on technology, but we're going to be deep diving, uh, certainly for a 20 minute webinar, uh, into a lot of economics and finance. Uh, and I think you're going to find it fascinating. I have as well, and I'm looking forward to rereading all of this and hearing it again. It's a lot to take in, but it is most important for the, those of us who believe in free and open markets. Now, the format today is almost as ever. Uh, I get out of the way as quickly as I can so that you can hear from our experts. Uh, Paul and Dimitri will be speaking for 20 minutes, uh, roughly, and then we'll have uh, 20 minutes of Q&A. Uh, a few housekeeping rules. Uh, firstly, yes, this is being recorded and the recording will be up in about uh, 48, uh, 48 hours. So uh, you can probably see it about midday on Friday in time for weekend viewing with family and friends. Uh, especially as the coronation isn't on any longer. So it gives you something to watch. Uh, second thing is that yes, uh, you can interact using what the GoToWebinar facilities. Uh, Paul, Dimitri and I are here with you. So we're not on Zoom, uh, we're, not, we're not answering emails, we're not uh, doing WhatsApps. Uh, so do use the GoToWebinar facility to send me questions, comments, observations, if you will, and I will feed them into the Q&A discussion. All of your comments and observations will be sent to Paul and Dimitri with your email attached so they can get back to you. If you want to contact them about something, uh, just say so and, and put it into the chat facility area. Um, and finally, uh, we are going to have a little bit of fun this morning with, believe it or not, uh, a, a poll. Um, and so if I could, we're going to ask you before we start, do you believe that markets are basically efficient or not? Um, this is a tough poll, yes or no, as you'll, uh, I'll leave the are you uncertain out of this one for the moment. Uh, Paul and Dimitri, our audience on FS Club tend to be uh, quite opinionated, uh, or at least know they're on mind, I guess is what you'd say. Uh, and so well over three quarters of the audience have already voted. So we're going to show those results to you now. And we're going to see what's happening here. We've got roughly a, a 60-40 split. Uh, with, uh, as you might expect, a lot of us with an economics and finance background, uh, how could we, how could we in any way, shape, or form, uh, be uh, <laughs> be heretics against our religion? So let's see if we're right, though, as we go through this presentation. So, if I may, um, uh, Paul and Dimitri, the floor is very much yours. Thank you very much, Michael, for inviting us. Um, I will talk for a few moments and then hand over to Dimitri. Um, we um, set up together uh, 16 years ago the Center for the Study of Capital Market Dysfunctionality at LSE, London School of Economics. Uh, I had spent an entire career which has spanned academic, asset manager and policymaker um, puzzling about what causes asset prices to move and how are they formed, uh, were markets sufficient or not efficient. Uh, I started thinking about this first before even the uh, efficient market hypothesis was 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 written up by Thama and others in the uh, in the early in the mid sixties. Uh, uh, Dimitri um, is is an academic. Uh, he's finance professor, um, starting back in uh, I think '04 at LSE and before that at MIT and Stanford and. He unusually had in those days at the start, uh, he had, when we were first talking about the cent setting the center up, he had been questioning the efficiency of markets. Now, so we've been going, uh, not just the two of us, but um, a 
quite a large group of uh, affiliated colleagues, LSE, um, something like six or seven professors and other faculty and doctoral students. And we've been putting together, building a theory of mispricing. Uh, the big step right at the beginning was that um, we took account of the fact that individuals typically don't trade directly themselves in the market. They hire asset managers or invest in funds that are managed by, by um, asset managers, professional asset managers. Um, the three things that we, three great issues that uh, we started with and wanted to ad address and explain uh, were momentum, which Fama has called, well, which is trend following, um, either market stocks, individual stocks or sectors. Momentum, uh, the, what Fa Eugene Fama of Efficient Market Hypothesis uh, uh, describes as the premier unexplained anomaly. The other was that um, was value. As an asset manager, I spent 20 years using momentum and value, uh, exploiting both trending and also the fact that large components of stocks can become cheap. Why do they become cheap and why do some become dear? And the third uh, anomaly, uh, which is least, has been least talked about in 50 years, strangely, is the inversion of the relationship between risk and return. The normal assumption of markets and, and, and the teaching, uh, in fact, one of the pillars of asset pricing is that the higher the return uh, is accorded to stocks with the highest risk. Uh, there's a positive relationship. In fact, uh, the evidence over all the decades uh, has been that uh, there is either um, no relationship or that it is inverted in stocks to some extent in other sectors. Now I'll pass you on to Dimitri to go through some of the, the, the work. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I will talk about um, uh, three main papers that um, Paul and I have um, worked on that speak to these uh, very anomalies that um, um, kind of predict the patterns of, uh, market of return predictability that Paul uh, mentioned, why they may arise and what do they mean for uh, investors. So first I will start with momentum and the value and based on uh, the work that Paul and I have done is called an institutional theory of momentum and value. Uh, so so the idea is as follows. So as Paul said, momentum essentially is the, the fact that um, um, returns of um, at the stock level or the, at the level of sect industry sectors or even asset classes can be predicted uh, based on past returns and in the short run kind of uh, stocks that have done well or assets have, that have done well tend to predictably do well on average in the future and vice versa for ones that have done poorly so our theory is as follows it's kind of is based on flows uh, into in or out of investment funds so let's say that there is a negative shock that hits uh, the fundamentals of, uh, let's say, an industry sector. So funds that overhold that the uh, big positions in that sector are going to do poorly. And as a consequence, they will experience outflows from their investors um, who somehow start doubting the um, ability of the managers running those funds. As a consequence, um, funds are these funds are to meet the outflows. They are going to start selling so stocks within the sectors. And uh, the key point is that if flows are gradual, as they are in practice, they don't take place instantly, but they take place kind of gradually over time, then this will cause a gradual price decline. And kind of, uh, and, to, and this is kind of what's going to be the momentum part. And also, kind of this is connected with uh, um, this uh, anomalous behavior of the market is connected with value as well, because at some point these flows, these excessive flows somehow cause the price of the, of the sectors of the stocks in the sector to be below the fundamental value so uh, as a consequence uh, expected returns eventually rise although at the beginning kind of for a long time while the flows take place uh, returns are low so now there is one uh, aspect of that theory that i mentioned that you may question you say okay fine the flows can be gradual but why um, why the the effect of these gradual flows is not fully anticipated into prices another way to say that is why uh, do investors abs uh, absorb who is going to buy these stocks knowing that on average they are expected to go down even further 
So essentially, we can bring back the notion of efficient, of market efficiency, and anticipating kind of um, uh, future price movements. And so the answer, when we saw this theoretically in the paper, is as follows: it had to do with kind of some long-term investors being there in the market. So, so think of a point of view of an investor who sees that these some stocks are being um, as, uh, are kind of being gradually sold over time, and this the, the expect, they know that these stocks are already cheap. They would become even cheaper on average in the future as they are being sold over are going to be on average sold over time as a consequence of these outflows. Now, this long-term investor says, "Okay, I can either buy now, which is I, I'm buying a cheap asset that may become even cheaper on average, but already I'm I'm buying it kind of cheap, so I get one bird in the hand." Now, if I wait and I buy it after the outflows occur, after the asset has become even cheaper in the future, on average I will buy it at a better price, but there is the risk. That these outflows might not occur after all, something kind of might happen in the future, and this undervaluation may disappear. So I may prefer to lock in the attractive kind of uh, long uh, long run return now. So I'm happy to buy an asset even though on average I know it's going to be uh, go down even more. So this is kind of the so bottom line momentum um, is is caused by flows and uh, by these gradual flows. And these gradual flows are not fully reflected into prices, even in a rational market. So isn't, there's nothing irrational in what in that uh, what, what I've been telling you so far. This kind of investors can be rational here. Now, uh, just a little bit of evidence that is support this um, idea, which comes from a paper actually by one of our colleagues at the LSE, uh, Dong Lu, who what what he does is that he has done this big data exercise to. Um, predict flows in or out of mutual funds based on the past returns of the funds and he has in, uh, imputed so based on what the uh, based on the assumption that when a fund experiences um, uh, uh, let's say outflows is going to sell some of its portfolio uh, or when it experiences inflow is going to buy more of similar stocks as what it has been holding it um, he has his compute he's finding a way to predict which stocks are going to be bought or sold in the future and he shows that the um, based on this uh, essentially future expected price pressure for individual stocks he can predict a good part of these stocks future price movements and this this his measure of flows future expected flows ex explain a good part of stock level momentum okay so this is kind of which is very consistent with the idea that I, I, I was telling you before the theory i was telling you before so paper number one paper number two um, essentially we take that um, theory very seriously and we go to look for its implications for the um, portfolio choice, how port in long term, long horizon investors should be thinking about their portfolios. So, we finance theory is a bit kind of short in, in terms of um, guidance for long horizon investors in a non CAPM world. There is quite a bit of work on how they should be investing, uh, let's say, uh, to take into account of the fact that maybe um, the stock market ex expected return goes down when the market goes up. But um, there is not much there is very little uh, it, um, work in, say, in terms of saying how should investors invest in the cross section let's say of stocks or um, or with and within the stock market let's say when there are kind of this mispricing within the market so essentially we take um, uh, we do it we take our mod we calibrate our model and we do some exercises that i will describe so the main results are that the horizon makes a big difference in terms of how you think you should thinking about your investment strategy so the performance of value and momentum strategies, which we essentially we run through our our model, our model which is a model where which in which kind of this momentum and value can be profitable for the reasons I described before. So varies a lot with investment horizon. So values sharp ratio um, decreases with horizon for over short horizons. I will show you a picture in the next slide. So but eventually it increases and increases quite a bit for long horizon investors, while uh, momentum sharp ratio essentially decreases over short horizons but then it essentially stays flat so as a consequence for long horizon portfolio uh, so investors the ultimate portfolio generally tilts from momentum towards the uh, value so long horizon investors should be giving a higher way to value than short horizon investors also we find ways that we can predict this the, the performance of value and momentum can be predicted based on uh, fund flows uh, kind of uh, on different stages of when, when flows occur and in particular, we find a new predictor for, especially for the performance of value, which is the correlation between momentum and value returns. Uh, of course, also the value spread is, we show is a, is a good predictor of value, especially for long horizon sharp ratios. So uh, here's the picture that I was um, alluding before. So 
these are the sharp ratios of, uh, of value strategies and momentum strategies a function of, for the of the horizon of an investor. Now, uh, they, so they vary quite a bit with horizon. Uh, so you see, for example, for value, as I was saying before, if an investor has a short horizon, kind of sharp ratio of value is generally relatively low and actually is even declining a bit with horizon for short horizons. But as horizon lengthens, value becomes more and more of a desirable strategy. Well, momentum sharp ratio, which is the red, it's approximately flat. So, and uh, all this, the logic for this picture, what's the mechanism here, has to do with the uh, long run risk versus short run risk of these strategies. Long run risk, uh, the risk, in other words, for a long horizon investor, depends very much on the, of the, auto, on the autocorrelation of strategy returns. So, value has this property that its returns are negatively autocorrelated over long horizons. If value underperforms, uh, has let's say a few years of underperformance this means that the the assets that it, it's holding which are kind of these cheap assets become even cheaper and their it's their expected returns go go up and value even gives greater weight to these assets because they are even have become even cheaper so its expected return becomes really high so this kind of property this negative autocorrelation causes causes its long run risk to be low and its um, sharp ratio to be high for long horizon investors so essentially so the bottom line here is that the uh, pension funds should be thinking or other long horizon investors should be, should be thinking very differently about um, uh, investment in this kind of in, in, a, non, in, a, in a market with in a non-campaign world let's say in a market with kind of these different patterns of predictability than let's say implied by very short horizon metrics as is quite often done in practice so <clears throat> finally and um, i should talk a little bit about the problems um, caused by benchmarking and the kind of tracking constraints so, and how this relates to the uh, inversion between risk and return that Paul mentioned. Okay, so here the point of departure is um, that um, uh, asset managers are constrained in, uh, not to deviate too much from benchmark indices. I mean, we made this uh, kind of dichotomy between active investors and active funds and passive funds, but even active funds are to a significant extent passive because they cannot deviate too much from their benchmark indices. I mean, maybe, maybe some active funds have a lot of leeway, but many active funds have limited leeway. And so let me now give you a, 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 an example of what these constraints uh, can, can do. So let's take, let's suppose that constra constraints, as they often do in practice, they take some the form that, let's say, sector weights cannot deviate um, of a fund, the, the way that it gives different industry sectors, cannot deviate um, more by more than, let's say, 5% from a benchmark, from the benchmark weights. <clears throat> so let's take, let's take now an overvalued sector, which has uh, 10 percent weight in the index and let's say that the fund recognizing the overvaluation gives it five percent weight so it essentially the minimum weight it's allowed to give now if this sector this overvalued sector uh, rises even more goes to 20 percent uh, weight then <coughs> the um, managers will uh, the weight of the managers rises mechanically to approximately 10 percent it was five percent now it doubles but managers must buy must buy the sector to, ra to raise the weight to 15% to meet their constraint. So to this 5% deviation. So essentially there is this procyclical trading, uh, buying something that appreciates driven by the constraint. This, okay. So this is um, some of the work that uh, with also Andrea Buffa and Paul and I in the um, some uh, published in the, in the journal of political economy. So now what this idea that I mentioned has the following implications. First of all, um, overvalued stocks have higher volatility than undervalued stocks. Overvalued stocks are associated with procyclical trading. You, uh, some managers have to buy them when they appreciate in price. While the opposite actually happens for undervalued stocks. The, the trading is counter-cyclical. So ma uh, managers, when they appreciate a lot to meet their constraints, managers are going to sell them. So this gives rise to this inverted relation, can give rise to the inverted relation between risk and return, and is driven primarily by the overvalued stocks. There is kind of quite a bit of work in the in emp uh, empirical work in the finance showing that uh, many anomalies in markets are driven by, primarily by the overvalued part of the by the long by the short side of the anomaly the overvaluation kind of part and uh, essentially we show that this uh, kind of is, is not surprising because the it's hard it, overvaluation is harder to correct than undervaluation also momentum is more pronounced within overvalued stocks that's another implication of this kind of theory and um, because essentially it's it is the procyclical trading is primarily concentrated in this uh, in these assets that are being over uh, overvalued and managers are underweighting and have to buy when they go up 
So, and also another implication very related is that this momentum is generated primarily by benchmarkers. They are generating the flows that, that um, kind of are driving the momentum. So, um, okay. And um, all right, so let me uh, stop here and I will let Paul uh, take over and uh, conclude. So uh, what are the implications of this new body of theory that we've just um, described? Um, first of all, it, it is a unified body in the sense that um, uh, we, uh, uh, we have various uh, explanations for mispricing, but they are all interrelated. They're not, uh, it's not a piecemeal set of explanations. It's not picking up one explanation for one distortion. It's actually, we find each paper we write um, provides a, a compounding of the of, of the understanding and the, of the analysis. Uh, what it boils down to um, is that um, investing actually comprises only two basic strategies. Everything falls into either a momentum, which targets short-term share prices and short-term valuations on the one hand, and investing on the basis of fundamental value, what the estimates of future cash flows of companies and, and, and uh, assets are. Um, so, and that's a long-term approach, uh, and it's based on fundamental value and disregards the short-term share price fluctuations. Um, and you can think of the stock market as being um, a battleground between these two strategies. That's why is, that's the sort of essential uh, reason for the inefficiency. Uh, the momentum traders or the, that part of whatever strategy the fund is uh, uh, involved in momentum, which is, can either be benchmarking or a pure momentum strategy, that's targeting a short term return and valuation, whereas value is targeting the long run cash flow. So it's a battleground and it cause, is, is the cause of the bubbles and crashes. Um, it, it gives uh, one of the most interesting uh, findings is that the analysis shows that there's a bias to overvaluation. There's a bias to overvaluation of markets, sectors and stocks. Some will be undervalued, of course, but the bias is always to the overvaluation. Uh, the second implication is that we've already touched on it is the inversion of risk and return, uh, which is um, particularly important because it indicates the scale of the distortion. Now, you, you know, we might say, oh, well, prices are, are wrong, but uh, the question is, how wrong are they? Well, the fact that the imperfections are enough to distort the relationship between risk and return is pretty darn big. Uh, the implications, it isn't just the stock market isn't just a game of investors who wins and who loses uh, it it is giving signals so mispricing gives false signals to the corporate sector which in, then engages itself in uh, the, the choice of does it invest for the short run or does it invest for the long term and so many strategies of corporates have become led by the short termers of, of investors that they corporates have become um, rather more biased towards the short term than the long term. Uh, essentially, um, the body of theory of dysfunctional markets, um, it, it pretty well overturns every strategy and policy based on, on market efficiency. For instance, uh, if, if prices are wrong, it, it puts a question mark about using mark to market. It puts a question mark on, on passive investing based on, on index. Uh, it puts a question mark on using share prices as um, a basis for rewarding CEOs of businesses. Um, it also undermines what used to be talked about much more, but less so these days. Modern portfolio theory is based on the relationship between um, uh, risk and return being positive, where if it's, it, if it's negative, then th that upsets the whole prediction of uh, modern, modern, so-called modern portfolio theory. So how about making markets more efficient? Um, the, the, the point about a theory that explains mispricing is that it, it can show how to deal with it. 
uh, in, in fact, to have a theory of efficient markets, the efficient market hypothesis that predicts perfection, it can't understand imperfection, so it can't actually show how investors should deal with imperfection. But, but a theory of dysfunctional markets can indeed very directly do so. Uh, it shows the course and it suggests the remedies. Uh, and what we show is actually the solution um, for improving the efficiency of markets really depends uh, very much, not wholly, but largely uh, on the way giant funds, the giant pension, sovereign wealth, charitable foundations, the way they contract with uh, and monitor and deal with the principal agent problems arising from delegation to asset managers. There is actually a, a, a private early bird advantage as well as a huge social benefit for having markets more efficient. Um, uh, and adopting strategies uh, that uh, exploit the mispricings rather than amplify them. Um, for instance, sustainability, you could argue that ESG, um, it's a precondition that, that um, prices um, uh, should be based on, on long-term uh, expected cash flows. It, it depends on, in, investors and corporates acting for the long term. So the, a lot of the energy and, and sustain, uh, on sustainability issues should be actually directed at getting investors, large funds and corporates to be long-termist. Um, the technical papers that Dimitri has drawn attention to uh, include all the proofs um, and, and some of it's heavy going for me, certainly. Um, but. I would strongly recommend a paper we've recently done, um, which is published in the Atlantic Economic Journal, Asset Management as Creator of Efficient Markets, Inefficient Markets. It draws together the various strands uh, in a non-technical way. Let me close by saying that it's pretty bizarre that in 2023, we can do amazing science, but we can't deliver efficient capitalism. Thank you. You're silent, Michael. Sorry, th thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to both of you for a wonderful presentation and all the hard work you're doing. Uh, we've got quite a few uh, questions and comments. Uh, and again, folks, just type into the chat room if you wish to participate in the conversation. Um, Hugh Purser uh, started out by pointing out how recent some of this is, that the first cap-weighted index was launched by S&P, the, the S&P 500 in 1957 in the States. And, the FTSE 100 was only launched in 1984, and Morgan Stanley launched its global MSCI indices in 1986. So, um, you know, it, it is intriguing this, but uh, Hugh wanted to ask, how does active management of funds versus passive, which is all index weighted, vary today between say the USA and the UK markets? And does that have any implications for your work? Mm. Um, so, um... I think that um, so I, in the obviously there is this a uh, huge uh, trend uh, in um, more in the kind of th this growth of passive. So in the U.S. Uh, pa um, passive uh, in the U.S. equity market, passive has overtaken active, um, and about two two years ago, and kind of still the trend is strong. Uh, so um, um, so. By the way, passive, I didn't talk about this today, Today we didn't mention it, uh, but passive can also bring its own distortions. So it's not that uh, kind of moving from, certainly moving from active to passive uh, is going to solve many of the problems that we are mentioning. So pa pa passive is uh, actually can um, um, cause, the growth of passive can benefit primarily the largest firms. There is some work that um, I have done that um, shows that. So in any case, now, I guess, is it, difficult to kind of to give us to, to speculate on that kind of in, in, over a short period of time about also the difference between the UK and the US but let me say that um, let me just I guess the main answer is that the, the growth of passive especially above some kind of threshold can um, is not necessarily a good thing for market efficiency both of the, because of the distortions that passive uh, generates and also because there is kind of it's going to be quite uh, little active and um, and uh, if we want active to operate the way we, we said all suggested uh, it might be a problem for correcting some of these distortions. 
Okay. Now, both uh, Martin White and Keith Robertson uh, have referenced Andrew Smithers. Uh, Martin is saying, uh, do you find Andrew Smithers' views on value and the drivers of corporate behavior, as set out in his books, Valuing Wall Street and the Economics of the Stock Market, useful in thinking about long-term returns and asset price levels? And Keith uh, goes on to say, you know, how useful is the work of Smithers and Wright using Tobin's Q ratio? Um, shall I have a go at that? Um, uh, very briefly, um, uh, Andrew is a, a good friend and um, really um, his work on corporate finance in particular um, is, is very thorough and um, his views actually are, are, are quite aligned with our own and the conclusions of his analysis and our analysis uh, point to the, uh, the thing I was mentioning, which is that uh, short-termism can be a problem with corporates and it's driven by corporates uh, satisfying the demands of investors for either uh, companies avoiding takeover and they're focusing on the short term, doing buybacks, um, uh, spending their money on buybacks rather than investing for the long term. And, and uh, Andrew has um, ex extensive uh, data on that and, and good analysis. Um, and um, uh, so, yes, it, it's important. Um, if, if investors are, it, it depends on the market being efficient. I mean, it, it isn't a game. It's, it's actually prices need to reflect as well as they can. Uh, and it's difficult to forecast future, but you, one's got to try and, and that will allocate capital in the corporate sector to the right uses. Okay. Well, you, you wouldn't expect uh, the FS community to, uh, to to do otherwise. They're all busy here thinking about ways to fix it. So a couple of suggestions, and which you may well have thought of. Bob McDowell is curious, would you seek a regulatory cap on the size of funds or their exposure as a remedial measure or some form of health warm warning appropriate to size and exposure of funds? Well, do you want to say that you have? Uh, I, I'm, uh, I, I mean, two things. One is I'm a, a great advocate of free markets. It's just that they don't work very well. I'm not an advocate of regulation. I think the market should be actually shown how they can actually improve for their own benefit, actually. That, that's the important thing. Um, and I, I really think that the academic theory of efficient markets has been a real downer. Uh, it, it's led um, to um, uh, a misunderstanding of, of by regulators uh, and and so on i mean there's um practitioners asset managers and and giant funds know that markets are to a varying degree in, uh inefficient and have been exploiting that inefficiency as best they can i think the point of our work is that it shows what the uh, we we show what rational behavior can actually deliver mispricing which is systematic and, and quite profound. Um, and if you've got mispricing, you've got misallocation of capital and lower returns on the market. So um, if, if, um, if, if some of the points that we have identified are handled, especially by the, the contracts that the giant funds write with their dele delegated manager, uh, then that would, mitigate some of the dis the amplification of the distortions that's going on. Very good. Um, Clive Bullen uh, brings it home here. He's sort of one of the main practical recommendations for private investors based on your findings. Um, and I would add to that uh, something for me, you know, when do we set up the mispricing fund to make uh, money out of this clear, uh, clear opportunity? Um, there are managers that focusing on focus on the long term. Um, they they uh, they do have funds that um, focus on the long term. The, the trouble is that um, investors uh, can be impatient and sell managers that underperform in a in a roaring bull market because they think uh, the tech sector or whatever has got overvalued. I mean, there's no. There are many views about what the future cash flows are going to be, and therefore they're going to be, even if people, folk, even if investors and funds 
focused on the long run, there are going to be many views. And um, but the, the, there's one very clear message from, what, from our work, which is that if you are investing without reference to fundamental value, uh, it, and that includes not just momentum, it includes momentum investors, main, not in, in, that's one part of it. The other part is it, um, benchmarking and tight tracking to benchmarks is itself uh, a late stage momentum strategy. And uh, that is combining to create the distortions and the, and, and the bad stuff. Uh, Funds should demonstrate that they are, to a greater extent, focusing on the long run estimates of fundamental value, which is hard work and needs um, repayment. And also, um, it's a question of finding the managers uh, that you think are doing a, the best job at, at, at pursuing that long term strategy. Uh, just following on that uh, theme there, Chris Wood is, says there's both a price for a stock and its so-called value. Uh, but given that both are determined by the interaction of supply and demand, how does one know when price and value invert? Could you just explain that a little bit more? Uh, uh, okay, so um, I just to make, want to make sure that I understand the question. So, um, uh, price, uh, okay, would you mind repeating this kind of price, price, I mean, in some sense, okay, okay, let me just, so value, a stock is, a, in, in our view, is a value stock if it's a, a measures of its, a, I mean, its market value is, a valuation is low relative to measures of, a, like its book, book value, equity valuation or other measures of fundamentals. So, and um, in our model, the, um, okay, so some stocks tend to be, uh, let's say, uh, have low price for, by the way, some stocks can have low price relative to this account measures of fundamentals because they are expected future cash flows are low. It's not that, the, 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 let's say, growth projects of these of these companies are, are poor. So it can be, a stock can be value for reasons that are entirely, don't have to do anything with mispricing, it can just be driven by, um, okay, the fundamentals. Now, additionally, stocks can, um, can be cheap because of this mispricing, or for example, because of these outflows, because this uh, money goes out of these funds, uh, driving the price of these stocks down, even though their fundamentals have not changed. So it's a combination of the two. Now, the extent to which a stock a stock's valueness changes, this um, this changes because can change in our model is what I was the story I was telling you uh, because of this uh, let's say this outflows. A stock can become even cheaper because just because uh, managers pull pull money out of these underperforming funds. Uh, but I'm not sure if I addressed the the, the, the full question or is. Uh, um, Maybe, I don't know, if I'm happy to elaborate, if it's unclear. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll move on then, if, if we could. Um, Shan Turnbull is curious, can the market be efficient when the nature of share traders is uh, share trading is price sensitive information, but stock exchanges do not require that the beneficial ownership be disclosed to the public or even to counterparties trading on their exchanges? Um, so would, would that in some way help is, is Shan's question. My view is that it, it will help, but it will um, uh, kind of more transparency, obviously, but it will not address some of these uh, fundamental distortions that we um, that we highlighted in our work. I mean, essentially, all or everything that we said, um, kind of these distortions about constraints, about uh, performance-driven outflows, these things can happen even when all information is transparent and the public. Good. Uh, Ian Conn is curious, does the increasing enrollment of pensions towards defined contribution and away from defined benefit funds encourage uh, more investment in passive funds? And that's exa uh, exacerbating the market as well. So the move from uh, fr from defined benefit into defined contribution. Shall I go there? Um, the, um... The shift um, has uh, taken place uh, over 30 years towards defined um, contribution. And um, uh, it, it's really, it's been driven by companies uh, seeking to reduce the risk of having to pay out um, uh, large, large sums unexpectedly uh, at awkward times. Um, and um, it, it's been a natural progression, and uh, it's 
it has also been amplified by um, the fact that uh, companies have um, not just shifted towards defined contribution, but have actually unloaded the um, uh, defined benefit and some of the other funds to um, to insurance companies, um, and and just dedicated the well put the whole lot into 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 bonds. Um, uh, I think that um, uh, if you, you have defined contribution funds uh, dominating as you do, then uh, the message is is just the same for the importance of investing for the long run. There'll be some um, pensioners benefiting from those funds, they'll have a short horizon, but in general, most of the money will be relative to the liabilities of pensions uh, payable in the distant future. So, okay. yeah. Sorry, Paul. I just want to add that, the, uh, just to emphasize the, po the point that Paul made, which is that the, uh, from defined benefit to defined contribution, this will um, most likely kind of um, increase the, the, the market risk tolerance and the investment in stocks as opposed to kind of staying in more in bonds. But the, as Paul said, uh, to address kind of uh, moving to pension to define contribution without addressing some of the contracting and kind of short horizon, short termist kind of problems that we highlight uh, will not um, solve the, I mean, can cause mis kind of these mispricing problems in the, in the stock market, even though there, there can be some benefit in kind of this uh, that, I meant, that we mentioned. Okay. We're only going to have time for one or two more, but I'll just read a few of the comments out here. Uh, Hugh Purser reminds us that an important element of uh, uh, modern portfolio theory was, of course, also diversification, which you're not uh, fighting. It's a, it's more the pricing element. Uh, Bob McDowell's curious about uh, what we could do in terms of deploying artificial intelligence in your analyses or e even to some of the funds. Uh, Hugh Purser, again, is curious about the influence of hedge funds and short selling uh, impacting the traditional investment industry. Um, Can I pick up on the AI? Uh, yeah, just, sure. just, just quickly. Um, I think uh, AI um, is it can be uh, hugely relevant. Actually, um, it can be um, developed to um, uh, identify the extent to which funds are being managed for the short or the long run. Uh, I won't go into the, the details of it, and this is all sort of um, ideas that have been percolating. Um, uh, only recently, uh, but but AI can I think be a, actually a force for good to demonstrate uh, the horizon that a fund is actually being managed on, and whether that's appropriate for the liabilities. Well, that's a great a great thing uh, to conclude on. Uh, let me let me wrap up two questions, which I think are related to taking that point slightly further forward, Paul. Um, Basically, uh, Simone Kiriakou says, you know, in your research paper, you talk about unskilled managers and their effect on fund performance. How can the average retail investor know whether a manager is skilled or unskilled when momentum and market movements can obscure the underlying quality of the asset allocation or skill until it's too late? Um, Peter uh, also put in that a friend of his used to run a fund that focused on mispriced assets, but in the end he was pushed out because the results didn't come fast enough for the investors. And in my my case, I remember Financial Security Assurance, which was a monoline that very responsibly in 2006, seven said, no, this market's insane, but everybody then removed all their money. So they, they too found themselves a, a, a bit stuffed uh, despite that. But I'll, I'm gonna conclude and leave the last thought to you. This is Martin White saying, would you agree with this view, Paul? Whilst the market as a whole may tend to be overpriced, there is no intelligent alternative for clients to cheap passive funds given the cost of active investing? Um, I'm uh, very sympathetic to uh, somebody making that decision. Uh, I do think that globally, we're spending um, three or 400 billion on asset management fees in the zero sum market. So, um, uh, and I, I do think fees are high and uh, unfortunately, the rewards often go to short-term success. They, they really shouldn't. Um, I'm sympathetic. Um, uh, my own 
I mean, personally, uh, I prefer to invest in companies that I judge to be um, in sensible, uh, in, in, in um, their activities are in areas that I think uh, have a future, good future. Uh, and I tend to stick to, to companies through thick and thin. Uh, and uh, sometimes, as in the last year or two, you can be hugely challenged by that. But uh, in the long run, I, I, I think how, buy and hold is not a bad idea. Okay. Well, we've just typed up uh, the poll there, folks. So please do answer the poll. Uh, we'll present those results to you quite swiftly. Uh, and just a reminder, it was a uh, 57% yes, 43% no the last time we had the vote. Uh, we're just going to close that poll down now and display it and share the results. And uh, so our market's uh, basically efficient. Well, you've uh, you've uh, definitely <laughs> moved the audience to no, <laughs> but it's, it's a little bit bare there, uh, to be honest. Uh, but nevertheless, a uh, good job. Um, I must say, I mean, I, I love the idea of somebody uh, creating a market for mispricing. I, I'm sorry, a theory of mispricing. I think that's absolute genius. So, you know, well done to both of you. And I believe this. Con uh, I believe some of the things that you're saying need to be heard more loudly and clearly. And we could have a much longer discussion. But one of the things we try and do here is to keep to time. Uh, and we have run over just a few minutes because I think it was worth it. Um, but may I uh, give three quick rounds of thanks? Uh, firstly, again to our sponsors. Uh, I, I should think every single one of them. Uh, would find this useful, interesting, and very much uh, uh, worthy of discussion. Uh, secondly, to thank the audience. You've been absolutely superb. And uh, all of the links and things that you sent in will be uh, sent to Paul and Dimitri so that they can see it. Um, as ever, do keep an eye on the website if you want to see what's forthcoming. Um, but uh, tomorrow morning, we have a very fascinating uh, session with uh, Asia and Europe talking about the emergence of global emissions uh, trading schemes, uh, particularly uh, between China and the EU. And we have uh, quite a few Chinese experts uh, speaking at that. But of course, the biggest thing I need to say is thanks to both of you, Dimitri, for getting up at an outrageous hour in the morning. It shows the dedication you have to your idea uh, and your theory. Paul, as ever, a delight to be associated with you in any way. You're one of the people I've most admired in the market over many, many years. Uh, unfortunately, folks, uh, despite many hints that we keep dropping to GoToWebinar, which we happen to like as a system, nevertheless, they've failed to come up with a technological way of the applause. I know people are typing in here, uh, thanks to you and, and what a good session it was, but I'm afraid all I can offer you at the moment is our Korean karmic clapper, <laughs> which we'll have to do as a substitute. Uh, Thank uh, you very much. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Yeah.